Yeah. Uh, thanks, Rafi, for the invitation and such a kind introduction. Uh, so, am I audible, by the way? Sorry? Am I audible? Yeah, I think Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. I can hear you very clearly. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, thanks, Shaofeng. Uh, so, let me now start the talk. So, today I am uh, planning to talk about, uh, as the title mentioned, aggregating a data set from rankings to strings. So, today what is my plan is to first give you a high-level overview of this area and what are the interesting questions that we want to answer. And uh, then maybe I will focus on one of my results. So, before starting, so let's cover some of the fundamental things or basics uh, about this area. So, what is string similarity? So, given two uh, pieces of text, we want to compare these uh, two texts and try to see that whether they are similar or not, or rather how similar they are. So, there are several ways we can do that. And one of the classical ways is Hamming distance. So, suppose we are given uh, two pieces of text, which are uh, binary strings. Now, what is Hamming distance? So, Hamming distance is essentially the coordinate-wise dissimilarity. So, basically, how many coordinates the values are different. For example, here you can see that I marked as red that uh, this position is 0, 0, 001, so that substring is replaced with 110, and there is a substring 00, 0, which is replaced with 11. One, one. So that's why the having distance is 5 here. But uh, sometimes it turns out that having distance is not good for many practical applications. So one of the problem with it is the following. So suppose we are given these two uh, text. Uh, one text is saying that, hey, Diptarka, how is your life at NUS? Another text is, hey, how is your life at NUS? Now you can see that between these two texts, only difference is this word Diptarka, my name. Uh, but if you just compute the having distance, it will say that they are very dissimilar, these two texts, because coordinate-wise, all these characters are uh, different. But this is not really the case. So essentially, it is just the difference is one word. So and that is the motivation. I mean, why uh, people start uh, defining a new dissimilarity measure. So one is edit distance, which basically captures that how many characters are different. In the sense that how many characters are, say, deleted or inserted. So here, so we just delete the word Diptarka. So that's why the edit distance is small. So more formally, so edit distance count the minimum number of edit operation. And in the more in the more standard format, the standard edit operations are that we consider are deletion, insertion, and substitution. So if you think of, I mean, if you just recall that what was having distance. So in having distance, it was coordinate-wise dissimilarity. You can think of like how many substitutions it has. So that's why having distance is also a special kind of edit distance where the allowed edit operation is only substitution. But in the more general form, we also uh, include deletion and insertion as standard edit operation. So there are actually many uh, versions of the edit operation. Perhaps uh, whatever versions I have shown here is the most standard one. But depending on the edit operation that uh, can be allowed in certain application, this uh, notion of edit distance will change. <laughs> okay, so this edit distance has various applications. I mean, for example, in the uh, file synchronization, when we try to update our files in the cloud, so there are also people first uh, compute the edit distance and try to see that how many changes happens from the last version and accordingly it updates the file. Another application is say auto scale collection in natural language processing. So like suppose we want to type this correction and suppose R is missing. So these days uh, all the text editors, they perform this auto text correction. So essentially they find the edit distance with some of the words in the dictionary and find the, what is the closest word. And this closest now is according to edit distance. Then there 
there are other applications in pattern uh, recognition, uh, in DNA matching, database system, and many more. So I'm not going to talk about the applications. So I will focus on one of the applications later. Okay, so this is all about edit distance. And how can we compute edit distance between two strings? Actually, then we have to recall or under that algorithm course, because there we have been taught about uh, this dynamic programming and there one of the classical example is the computing edit distance. Perhaps some of you uh, could recall that algorithm as computing longest common subsequence. So the algorithms are essentially the same for both edit distance and length. Uh, longest from subsequence. So, and that is how we compute edit distance exactly in quadratic time. So, quadratic in the length of the input. And unfortunately, for exact computation, this is roughly the best thing so far we can do. Uh, not uh, much better we can do. But for approximation side, uh, uh, there are lots of reasons. Uh, but I am not going to talk about that because uh, this talk is not about uh, approximating any distance. But just I want to make a note. And maybe if you ask me that what is the current state of the art for approximating any distance, so the current state of the art is that we can do uh, compute uh, up to constant approximation in almost linear time. Okay. But so far, I mean, in this talk, we will not need that result. I mean, this is completely independent of that. Okay, so I guess so far so good. So now in this talk, what we are going to talk about, we are not going to talk about computing edit distance, but rather the another uh, fundamental big data question, which is clustering, but clustering with respect to edit distance. So what does that mean? So suppose we are given a set of text. So our task is to cluster them the similar strings. Okay, so basically we want to aggregate the similar strings and form different cluster. So here, I mean, uh, I just uh, for simplicity, I just mark some of the text with different different colors, and essentially whatever the uh, some shapes of one particular colors are like, you can think of they are similar string. So for example, here, uh, what is our objective is like we want to. Uh, put all this almost red colored file into one cluster, almost yellow colored file into one cluster, green color file into one cluster and so on. And here when I say that what are the similarity measures, so there I consider the edit distance. So basically, if you consider two different shapes of color, I mean one particular color two different shapes, text file essentially their edit distance is small. So this is the question that we want to answer. Okay. Now, you may ask me that, I mean, why should we care about uh, clustering with respect to edit distance? Is there any particular application? Because cl clustering is a very fundamental problem, but mostly it has been studied so far under Euclidean space or L1 norm, um, yeah, L1 distance and some other, geometric distances also with respect to hamming distance but not much with respect to edit distance so one natural question is is it really applicable i mean why do we care about that well so now here is one specific application where actually we need clustering with respect to edit distance so this application is dna storage system so essentially there is uh Let's say some new technology coming up. So where basically we want to store data inside DNA. So currently we store data in some of the hard disk, uh, but uh, they don't have this uh, so-called uh, information theoretic density, not much high for them. So, but which is for the case of DNA. So now when in future we'll be dealing with like huge data, how do we store them? Maybe we will not have sufficient hard disk. So then one alternative is like we will store them in some DNA. So basically we will create some artificial DNAs and somehow store data there and then later using sequencing device, we retrieve them. So now I am not going to talk about like real details of this application, but at the high level, how it looks like that I will show you. 
So what we do in the DNS storage system is the following. So we take a uh, string, then we divide it into small, small chunks. Okay. And these chunks, we store them into the DNA, some artificial DNA. Well, and also, of course, there are some pre-processing required before storing into the DNA. We, have, uh, we make them almost random looking by basically adding some uh, pseudo-random uh, noise with it. And then also we use some of the error correcting codes, which will basically help in retrieving the data. But this is essentially what we do. So we chunk, uh, divide the large string into small chunk and then just store them. And now the main difficulty, I mean, this storing is not a problem. We can do that now. But the main difficulty comes in while retrieving the data. Because if I can, if I cannot retrieve a stored data, this is like useless. So I have to access that data. And for them, for that, what people do these days uh, in the DNS storage system is like uh, people use this next generation sequencing devices. And this uh, next generation sequence basically retrieves the data, but it creates several noisy copies of them. And what are these noise? The, these noise are essentially the edit noise. So essentially, it somehow randomly add some, I mean, like insert or delete some of the symbols from the stored data. <laughs> and whatever be our current uh, technology supports, this next generation sequencing, they allow some of the like around 16, 17% error. If I am not wrong, maybe there are even more modern, but I mean, what are like with reasonable price, whatever sequencing devices are available, they have some kind of 16 to 17% error. So now we have to deal with them, this 16 to 17% error. Okay, so what we uh, basically need, if you recall, so for the retrieval part, we need to retrieve all these chunks. But what we get is basically a collection of noisy copies of all these chunks. Okay, so the first task is clustering. So let's uh, let's first uh, try to at least uh, cluster these copies of noisy things uh, so that each cluster should represent one particular chunk. So this is the first step. Okay, and once we solve this first step that we perform the clustering, then the second step is let's from each of the cluster generate this actual data. This is the second step. Okay, so that is what the first step. Uh, I just formally type that this question is not that formal. So can we partition them uh, efficiently so that similar strings are in the same uh, partition and here second so recall by similar i mean similar with respect to edit distance because our noises that were inserted during this uh, sequencing i mean this uh, retrieval they were edit noise so that's why the edit distance i mean now we have to consider the edit distance while being clustered okay so is so far so good is there any question yeah, so I was just giving the high level idea of this area now. I mean, why we should uh, consider this question. Okay, so in this talk, I will not actually uh, talk about this clustering part, but rather I will focus on the second part. Like once I do the clustering, how can I retrieve the original stream? I mean, after performing clustering. So this question, this second uh, step, like, we will focus on one particular cluster. It has uh, noisy copies of one particular chunk. Now from them, how can I retrieve the original um, chunk? So this question is another fundamental question, which is called trace reconstruction. So what is the problem statement? So we want to reconstruct an unknown string from its noisy copies, which are like observable copies, and these observable copies are also called traces. So there is an unknown string X, 
say of length n and then but we cannot observe that unknown string so you can think of like this unknown string is the chunk that we stored in the dna storage system but rather what we can observe is some of the noisy copies say x1 x2 xn some m noisy copies and the objective is to recover this unknown string x and what we care about here so we want to use as few samples as possible because somehow uh, generating these noisy copies via sequencing devices are not that cheap so we want as few samples as possible and also while uh, recovering we want to minimize the error and as i mentioned like uh, current sequencing devices produce a 16 17 percent error so definitely, I mean, after recovering, we want like much, much lesser error than this 16, 17%. Ideally, we want something like one, two percent error because those could be handled by error correcting code. And third is, of course, we want our algorithm to be very efficient. Oh, so this is the trace reconstruction problem. And this has been studied widely. <laughs> But most of uh, most of it, I mean, so far, except a few results, everybody was, uh, maybe I go back to this slide. So in the literature for this stress reconstruction problem, somehow people looked into the exact reconstruction. So like uh, if you consider the second point, which I say that minimize the error, so they want error to be zero. And that's why the complexity increases. In many cases, they, uh, there are some lower bound that, uh, those many samples are necessary and so on. So, but essentially, uh, I mean, yeah. yeah. So, uh, when you see noisy copies, do you do you uh, think of it as some arbitrary one? So, you think it's uh, some noise as in uniform or, or random noise? Yeah, very good question. Yeah. So, okay, maybe I will come that later. Come to that point later. Okay. So, sure. Uh, so, okay, maybe I maybe I will answer that now. Okay, so there are uh, two types of trace reconstruction. Sure. So, okay, so one particular type say that the unknown string is arbitrary, mm -hmm. and another part say that unknown string is randomly chosen. I see. So when it is arbitrary, we call the worst case. When the unknown string is randomly chosen, it is called average case. And if you recall in the DNA storage application. When I say that in the DNA storage, there are some pre-processing involved. And during the pre-processing, we somehow randomize the stored stream using some uh, pseudo-random stream. So that's why for this particular application, you can think of like uh, this unknown string are roughly randomly chosen. I see. So for DNA storage system, really what we care about average case. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, uh, some small errors. I see. But the noises are always random. Mm -hmm. okay. so in the literature, whatever noises people consider, they are always random. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. And now, uh, all these lower bounds and, and upper bound changes. Is there, yeah. Is Sorry. there research yeah. of is there research of the embedded of the added distance into other easier spaces? Yes, good question. So there are uh, such results known. So there are some of the embedding of edit distances, Euclidean distance, Hamming distance. But the problem with them is uh, the distortion ratio. So when you embed, there is this distortion ratio. Those are very high. Thank you. And there are also some of the some lower bounds that if you uh, embed edit distance into say. Uh, Euclidean norm or Euclidean distance or something if I not so I think there are uh, omega log n lower bound yeah I, I think there are I, actually I think there might be other issues for instance if you think about this recovering uh, recover problem as you said the after the mapping to Euclidean yes. the solution that you find may not be mapped back to the edit distance. yes yes yeah. exactly right I exactly think, um, yeah so that's another thing. yeah yeah, that is another difficulty. So that's why uh, so far we don't know how to use actually the easier spaces uh, to solve this problem uh, in edit distance. Okay, any more question?
Okay, so now I guess let's proceed. So, okay, so now what about approximation? So, like I want to uh, reconstruct the trace, I mean the unknown string, but not exactly. Maybe I will allow some error. So, let's talk about approximation. So, for example, this uh, DNA storage system, I do not need exact reconstruction as I mentioned that there are some error correcting code involved while uh, storing the data. So, maybe I can allow some 1 2 percent of error. So, that's why it suffices to recover a string Z that is close to the unknown string. And here again, one of the natural closeness measure is edit distance, just because the whatever the strings we uh, talked about, they are noisy copies, and these noises are basically edit noise. So that's why edit distance makes sense here. <laughs> okay. So this is, uh, if you recall, that was this was our question that we want to focus on one cluster and we want to uh, perform this trace reconstruction. But uh there are not many efficient algorithms i mean like there are some theoretical algorithms but uh, they do not perform well in practice so actually what practitioners use is some kind of heuristic that uh, they say that okay maybe uh, really so instead of really solving the trace reconstruction let's try to find a representative of whatever the cluster is and one of the standard notion of representative is like find some stream that will minimize the sum of distances and that is called the median stream so what is median so given a set of strings over some alphabet our objective is to find one particular string and that string need not be from the input data it should be from the ambient space such that it minimizes the sum of distances to all the points. So, and here again, uh, I, I am only focusing on the edit distance. But median can be defined for respective of any metric. So, just replace this distance with some metric. And that is how I mean people actually uh, studied this median problem with respect to different different metric. And again, the complexity changes uh, depending on this metric. <laughs> And this y star that minimizes this objective value, that is called a median. Okay. But unfortunately, with respect to edit distance, this problem is NP hard. But there are some, um, again, basically extending this to our classical dynamic programming algorithm that uh, finds the edit distance for two strings. One can actually extend that algorithm itself and try to make and find the median string also and but now the complexity will become exponential in the number of strings and also length of this i mean so it will be essentially two to the m times n to the m where n is the length of each of the input and m is the number of input so this is essentially the exponential in m so the number of inputs so as long as your number of inputs are constant then this is polytime and since uh, in most of the practical applications, I mean, say for DNS storage, they generally uh, take this chunk size to be like roughly 100 and then they consider maybe a few traces and that's why this algorithm more or less works fine. But sometimes, I mean, when uh, this algorithm doesn't work fine in the sense that it takes too much time, then they use another heuristic to solve uh, this media. But let's not talk about uh, that. But uh, okay, so this is the upper bound, and also uh, it is known that this upper bound is roughly tight. I mean, we cannot do much better. N to the m uh, factor is somehow unavoidable under the assumption of strong exponential time hypothesis. Okay, but these are about the exact computation. Uh, oops. Yeah, so the question that we are interested in, can we do something better with uh, by allowing approximation? So what is approximate median? I guess all of you know the definition of approximation, but just to make sure that we are in the same page. So let me recall. So suppose this is uh, opt value I denote by opt of S. So now Y bar is called a C approximate median 
if the objective value with respect to y bar is at most c times opt, then we call y bar uh, approximate, c approximate medium. Okay. So this is exactly the same definition we use for any approximation algorithm. So C is the approximation ratio. So now, what is the connection between trace reconstruction and approximate median? So as I mentioned earlier that this is one of the common heuristic that practitioners use. Uh, they just uh, find median uh, instead of uh, doing trace reconstruction. Yeah, so here I also mentioned this term uh, multi-sequence alignment. I mean, I'm not uh, going to define it, but just want to uh, mention that many places instead of median, you will see this term multi-sequence alignment. So basically median with respect to edit distance is exactly same as multi-sequence alignment, but multi-sequence alignment is just some reformulation of this problem. Okay. And now, yeah, so this is the question to think, like, is there a definite connection? Because uh, as a heuristic people use, but so far we don't know any like formal connection between these two problems. So uh, last year uh, uh, with uh, Devati Tash and Robbie Krautkamer, we show that essentially these are, these uh, two problems are the same, at least in the average case. I mean, if you uh, consider the average case version, so recall the average case was the underlying string was randomly chosen. In that particular version, we show that these two problems are essentially the same. Like if you could solve the trace reconstruction, you will get a very good approximate median. On the other hand, if you can solve the approximate median version, you get a very good trace reconstruction. Okay. Uh, but again, uh, so this result I will not elaborate here, but this is just I want to mention that this is known. So, uh, yeah, you are feel free to uh, go to this paper and try to see. Uh, yeah, so, so far, let's summarize that. What are the questions we encountered? So, first question was, uh, can we do clustering efficiently? Clustering with respect to edit distance. Then the second question was how to perform approximate trace reconstruction efficiently. Because the first question was related to the first step of this DNS storage application and this was the second step. And then the third question was as uh, heuristic, I mean practitioners use as a heuristic that uh, instead of trace reconstruction just uh, use approximately. So the question was is there any definite connection? And I just mentioned that we show that for in the average case, they are exactly the same. But in the worst case, we don't know. Now, the fourth question is how to find the approximate median efficiency. So I just mentioned that with respect to edit distance, it's NP hard, and there are some even stronger lower bound um, under the assumption of strong exponential time hypothesis that N to the M factor is essentially unavoidable. But can we do something better using approximation? So now in the remaining talk, I will focus on this last question. Okay. So now maybe I will pause for a few minutes. So if you have any question so far, then please feel free to ask me. I guess there is no more question, so maybe then let's proceed. <laughs> so, what is the question that we encountered in this approximate median? So, the main question is can I get a very good approximate median, say constant factor approximation in poly time? Because exactly we know that it is NP hard. So, but can we do. Um, I mean, like, can we achieve constant factor approximation in polytime? So now, one may wonder, I mean, why do we really care about a constant factor? Uh, one natural one could ask, like, why not log n factor or something? But one question is, like, constant factor, we know that we can really achieve. So, for example, two factor approximation is really easy. Why? 
anybody has any guess? I know it's got. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know. So maybe you are not then allowed to answer. Right. I'm not allowed to answer. Yes. Okay. So here is what uh, we can do. So if you recall that in the median question, we wanted to find this median string or approximate median string, which need not be from my input set, right? So they can come from the ambient space. And that is where the difficulty comes in. So now let's try to only look into the input space, okay? And try to find the what is the best input that minimizes this objective function. Let's output that. So this can be done polynomial time easily because I can just even like I can do just brute force search. I can just uh, pick each of the input string, compute this objective value and so on and whatever be the string that has this minimum objective value output that. And using triangle inequality, we can show that this particular solution is essentially giving us two approximations. And there is nothing specific about edit distance here. It holds for any metric. That uh, if you want to solve this median problem, now if you just uh, only concentrate on the input space and output the whatever string achieving the minimum objective value, that will always give you two approximate solution. Okay, no matter whatever underlying space it is, as long as they are metric. So now the question is, can we have a PTAS? Or like even, I mean, like a simpler question, can we even just get something better than two approximation? Say 1.99 approximation, we don't know. So this is the story about edit distance. I mean, when we say that uh, I don't know how to break below two. But if I concentrate on one of the special case, like when if you recall, the Hamming distance is a special case of edit distance when the allowed edit operation is only substitution. Actually, in this particular case, uh, this problem is very easy. Why? So if you just uh, consider a single peak, suppose the x1 is 1, x2 is 0, x3 is 0, and x4 is 0. What is the median? It is essentially 0. So basically, if you take the coordinate wise majority, so then for particular that coordinate, whatever be the majority element, that will minimize the sum of distances. And now since the Hamming distance by definition, we compute them coordinate wise, essentially it is perfectly fine to optimize them coordinate wise. So that's why if you just output the coordinate wise majority, whatever the string we get, that uh, will be the median, exact median. It is not just approximate median, it will give you exact median. And this just runs in linear time because we just uh, uh, have to compute the coordinate wise majority. Okay, but uh, this is just a special case of edit distance. Uh, this is not the case for general edit distance. So now Hamming distance uh, was one of the special case. Now another special case uh, is when the all the input strings are not arbitrary strings, they are permutations. Okay. And so when they are underlying you know, all the input strings are permutation, then this uh, whatever the any distance is still we can define. And that is actually called Ulam distance. And that is another well known distance method. Okay. So, yeah, so that is what I just mentioned in the slide. So, when your input strings are just permutation over n, so then whatever be the edit distance between two permutation, which is like minimum number of insertion and deletion, that is called Ulam distance. So for example here, so suppose x1 is uh, this permutation from 1 to 9, x2 is also a permutation from 1 to 9. Yeah, somehow now I am giving, uh, previously I was planned to give this talk in 
my iPad. So now I cannot use the pin. So what you can do, so let me try to see if I can use some marker here. Some laser pointer is good. Maybe. Can you see this laser pointer? Yes, great. Okay. So now in the X1, you can see that uh, uh, this 785693214 and X2 is 275693814. So now one way we can transform X1 to X2 uh, is the following. We take this uh, 2 symbol and just put it before 7. And then when we put that, we have 2, 7, 8. So now we also have to move 8. So then what we do, we will move 8 just after 3. So these are like two move operations. We just take 2 and place it in front and also take 8 and place it after 3. So this two move operation, I mean, one can uh, think of this Ulam distance as just number of move operation. And with that, I mean, that uh, Ulam distance will be 2. But one can also uh, define uh, this thing as a, a set of insertion deletion operation. Because if you think of like one particular move operation, what we are doing, we first delete 2 and then insert 2 here. So this is like one move operation means one deletion and then one insertion. So basically one move corresponding to two edit operations. So that's why, I mean, equivalently one can also instead of counting moves just count the minimum number of insertion and deletion and here then it will be four so and this is uh, the ulam distance yes yeah. right so that is clear but uh, i remember that when you first define this added the distance you also introduce substitutions right yes, uh, yes. so now uh, we are not allowing substitution here that is a good catch um because i mean what is the problem with substitution is like uh, since now I want them to be permutation, if you now try to arbitrarily substitute something, maybe we can lead it to some uh, thing that is not a permutation at all. Mm -hmm. I see. So that is the reason, I mean, we don't consider substitution now. We just focus on insertion and deletion. Mm -hmm. Maybe even like uh, for thinking purpose, actually move is, uh, I think is the ideal candidate. Like uh, since uh, we cannot even insert or delete arbitrary symbols because we want it to be uh, permutation. We first have to delete something and then we can insert only that thing. We cannot insert some arbitrary thing. Yeah. So maybe move operation is like more intuitive thing. But okay. these are essentially same because one move is one insertion and deletion. Mm -hmm. In value, yes. Yes. Great. Okay, thanks. Okay. Now, so essentially, so in the literature, when uh, we consider this edit distance, like any computational problem involving edit distance, somehow it turns out that when we focus on Ulam distance, somehow the problem gets slightly simplified, but it still captures some of the inherent hardness of the edit distance. So uh, people I always try the, to solve. I guess this is distance is just uh, long as the common substrate. Yes, you are right. For longest common subsequence, that was uh, one question, which is like uh, essentially longest increasing subsequence when you just consider permutation. And uh, also like for two streams, I mean, there are some computational problems for Ulam distance. Those are also much easier than edit distance. For example, so when we compute the edit distance between two strings, it takes quadratic time. But when we know that they are permutation, then when we compute the Ulam distance, that can be solved in n log n time. Okay. Yeah. So and some so this is like natural uh, relaxation and uh, people first uh, attacking the edit distance question people first try to attack this ulam distance question and then get enough intuition and then maybe try to generalize them so sometimes it can be generalized sometimes not okay but if you see that in the title somehow i uh, make a question mark here that permutation is it a special case so actually, for this median problem, this is not really a uh, special case. So the problem is now, in the median, 
we want the output string to be arbitrary string. But now when we talk about permutation, we want our output string to be a permutation. It must be permutation. We cannot allow it to be like some unknown string. I mean like some arbitrary string. And that particular uh, necessity, that makes the problem slightly more difficult. Okay, so that's why this uh, ULA median is not really a special case of edit median. Okay, but why do we uh, care about ULA median? As I mentioned, that it captures some of the inherent difficulties of the edit metric. And second is like, even it has lots of applications. Because these permutations, you can uh, think it of as rankings. Okay, so when I say permutation from one to n, you can think of like one to n are the candidates, and some voter or somebody gives some rankings uh, among these n candidates. And Ulam distance is now an interesting dissimilarity measure among the rankings. And ULA median is essentially called the rank aggregation problem with respect to ULA distance. So, for example, I mean, you can think, suppose there are six candidates, and now there are four voters, they give completely different uh, rankings among these six candidates. So, maybe first voter prefer one over six, and then five, then three, then four, then two, whereas voter two prefer two the most. And then place one, then five, then three, then uh, four, then six, and so on. Then voter three prefer the five the most, then three, then one, then four, six, two, and also voter fourteen. Similarly, and now all these voters give some their preference order. But when we, if you recall, like. Uh, um, say when we hire somebody for some position. Okay, so the committee members rank the candidates. But finally, we want to hire, say, one guy or two guys. So then we have to make a concrete decision that to whom to hire. So now if the committee members gives uh, like completely different, different preference order, uh, we have to somehow combine them and try to make a concrete decision. Okay, so this is like one candidate we have to hire or if there are two candidates, maybe some two candidates we have to hire. And we cannot just say like the top preferences. For example, suppose we want to hire two candidates. And if you see like voter one, is, I mean, their uh, two preferences is one and six, here two and one, then five and three, then one and five. So uh, how do we like uh, come up with a consensus that these two candidates we have to hire and they are somewhere in the order? Okay, so this is the problem and this is what we want to solve. Like the voters keep the preference. All the voters keep their own preferences. And now somehow we want to combine them and try to come up with some consensus ordering so that we can uh, hire some uh, one or two people. So and that is the question of rank aggregation. That we are given all these uh, rankings and now come up with a aggregate rank. And now, when we say aggregate rank, again, uh, one of the natural notion is like finding the median. So basically finding a ranking such that it minimizes the sum of distances. And you can actually see that in this particular example, like from voter one, this aggregated ranking, we just move this particular element C. So thus the Ulam distance is two, here also two, two, two. So the sum of distances now here it becomes eight and some you can see that this is the optimal one for this particular example and it has several applications so such as theories sports database statistics and so on yeah so i'll not uh, give you the details about the application because i don't think i have much time left so now Let's see what is known about this problem. So, well, Ulam distance is one of the common dissimilarity measure among the rankings. But there are also other popular measures, for example, Kendall Tau, Spearman foot rule, 
and so on. And also Kelly, and there are several Minkowski distance. So, but one particular thing I just want to highlight here is Kin delta OT because this is one of the most popular measures. And in the Ulam distance, when we compute the distance, we compute the minimum number of uh, insertion and deletion. But here in the Kin delta, we count the minimum number of, I mean, number of inversions. Yeah, so you you don't have to know the definition for Kin delta for now. You can ignore, but just I wanted to point this out. And now what is known? So since I know, I mean, I just mentioned that Kin delta is one of the most popular uh, dissimilarity measure. So for that measure, actually we know that uh, the problem is NP hard. And even when the number of inputs are restricted to four. So basically if you are given four inputs and you want to compute the aggregate rank with respect to Kin delta, this problem is NP hard. But from the approximation side, you know of a uh, PETAS. So basically, polynomial time algorithm is known, which achieves one plus epsilon approximation. But the story is uh, more elusive in case of Ulam distance. Yeah, so the uh, Kindle Tau, okay, so just move before moving to Ulam. So for Kindle Tau, actually for three inputs, we don't know whether it is NP hard or NP. Four inputs, it is NP hard. Okay. So now for Ulam, we actually don't know whether it is NP hard or not. So I believe that it is NP hard, but I just don't know any uh, reduction. So maybe one of you can try and try to come up with a reduction and see whether it is NP hard or not. And of course, there is also a possibility that it is NP, and then maybe uh, you are also welcome to come up with a polynomial time algorithm. So. What we showed last year uh, in another result with uh, Das and Krautkammer, we showed that we can actually have two minus epsilon approximation for Ulam distance. So if you recall, I mentioned that for any uh, median problem, I mean, with respect to any matrix space, achieving two approximation is easy. So now the question is, can we get something better? So for Ulam, actually, what we show that well, we can have two minus epsilon approximation. But we don't know whether it is NP hard or not. And um, so that's why I say that uh, there's how incomparable this uh, current status, I mean, state of the art for Kin delta and ULA. Because for three inputs, for ULA distance, actually we show that it is NP. But on the other hand, you can see that for Kin delta, for three inputs, we don't know whether it is NP or NP. So is it also in P for four or five or constant number of inputs? Well, so for Ulam distance, uh, no, we don't know uh, for I four or five whether it is in P. But uh, well, so for four or five, actually, we uh, have a better approximation algorithm. We can actually, instead of two minus epsilon, we can actually have three by two, I mean, 1.5 approximation I see for that. four or five inputs. Uh -huh. Great. Yeah. So, but this two minus epsilon you are saying, can you set this epsilon to be 0 0.5 then? And not really actually. So I this see. epsilon is like really small. I see. This okay. is like some their existing epsilon. It is oh, like, oh, I see, like I see. for all epsilon you can do. Okay, okay. So it's different from PETAS, it's not for F. Yeah, yeah it is different F. from PETAS. It is like there exists some epsilon. Okay, I see. Is it is it dependent on the number of inputs? So the, the approximation algorithm? Yeah. Yes. Uh, is, is, epsilon, is, is, is epsilon dependent on the number of No, inputs? no, 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 no. Epsilon, okay. epsilon is a pure constant. It doesn't depend on the uh, input. So actually the two approximation that I mentioned before, so that actually one can prove it is uh, two minus uh, one by M approximation or one by M plus one. So that's why that actually gives two minus epsilon, but their aim is uh, dependent on this uh, number of inputs. But we want something independent of number of inputs. We want epsilon to be constant. Uh, so, Dipitar, I'm, I'm sorry that we will need to wrap up soon. Yeah. So yes. So I am going to uh, finish this soon. So I am not now uh, going to discuss about the result. So I just mentioned that uh, this is what we can achieve. Mm -hmm. So just uh, uh, quick things, I mean like,
quick summary of the in the technique so for ulam distance when i say that for three inputs we can solve it in p so what techniques we used is like we first relax the constraint that the solution need to be permutation what we just uh, we just use the edit distance algorithm the dynamic programming one it outputs some arbitrary string and then we round it to a feasible one so basically so this is similar to like uh, linear uh, programming relaxation you can think of and it is not linear programming but somehow similar first relax it to arbitrary and then we just round it to some feasible permutation and that is how we solve the three inputs and for constant input that gives 3 by 2 approximation and the similar techniques actually can be extended for center problem as well so which i am not going to talk about okay so this is about the constant number of inputs and for arbitrary inputs as i mentioned that there is a, a 2 minus epsilon ap algorithm so actually what we show is like for we show that when the objective value is large actually the approx the two approximation algorithm that basically finds the best input that itself breaks the two factor that is what we show and when the objective value is small and there are some cases there we have to design some algorithm otherwise basically the high design which is somehow believed to be the most hardest thing so there uh, we can break two factors just using that two approximation algorithm and that is one of our contributions okay so now let's go to our final slide yeah so what are the open problems so one open problem is can we get beta for ula media currently we just know two minus epsilon like 1.9 approximation but can we get something better say beta and another question is as i mentioned we don't know ula median is np hard or not can we show that it is np hard and it will be very good if we could show that it is np hard for four inputs or some constantly many inputs just like in delta and then the another question is can we extend this ulam uh, median algorithm to say a uh, edit median so actually we know that there are certain design we can extend which i did not talk about in this talk but in general we don't know how to extend and what about ulam center again can we extend that and then the uh, one of the promising direction i would say like recently i started exploring that like what if i want the output to be some kind of fair whatever the definition of fairness we have and then how can we solve this problem so basically now the problem is fair rank aggregation i want to aggregate rank but the output needs to be fair okay and that's my end of the talk so thanks for listening so if you have any question, please ask.